Well, especially thank you for being here on such a beautiful day because as we all know, this may be the last sunny, sunny day between now and what, July. Um, so I, I want to just um, start with this one slide about my current job because I'm gonna be talking about um, research I did before my current job. And um, so I just want to acknowledge two people that are connected with the BD Biodiversity Museum that are responsible for me having the job that I now have as a botanist at the Royal BC Museum in Victoria. And the first person is Olivia Lee, who is a botanist here. And um, she was the one that told me about the job I have in Victoria to apply for it. Otherwise, I don't think I would have known about it. Um, and the second person is Will Schofield, who passed away a few years ago. He was one of Canada's most prominent bot botanists. He was a specialist studying mosses. And I ran into Wilf in the Vancouver International Airport just prior to my interview in Victoria. And I said, Wilf, what should I say in my interview? <laughs> uh, what, are, what are some of the gaps in our knowledge of British Columbia flora? And he said, Northern British Columbia Alpine. So uh, there I am in the Northern British Columbia Alpine. So um, what I'm going to talk about today is research studies I did uh, from 1997 to 1999 when I lived in China. I first went to China in 1988. I first began connecting with a Chinese botanist, someone who studies plants, in 1985. In 1995, I went and I finally met um, Professor Pei Shenji, and we began discussing and exchanging emails about what kind of research I might do on ethnobotany, which I'll explain what is ethnobotany. Um, and finally, in 1997, um, my wife and I went to China, and we lived there for two and a half years. <clears throat> um, just a, one comment about the slides and the images. A lot of them, they're, they're a little bit fuzzy because I took them with a slide camera, um, and when they were scanned, some of them scanned well, and some of them didn't scan so well. So the big topic that I'll start with is just general, where does our food come from? Most of us imagine our food comes from grocery stores and from packages. And we have kind of a vague sense of, well, they come from some kind of plant or animal, but we're not really that connected with um, our sources of food. And this is something we should all think about because huge parts of this globe is devoted towards growing food. Um, and the other thing to keep in mind is most of the plants and animals that we eat today didn't exist thousands of years ago, maybe even hundreds of years ago. They are the result of domestication, um, through which, by which humans have selected particular um, varieties or cultivars of particular plants and because they were good to eat and they were easy to grow. Um, and for one example um, is wheat, which is actually a hybrid of three different species. Two of those species, it's been well known for many years what those two species were, but the third species that contributed some of the genes to wheat um, has only recently been clarified by people who study this kind of thing. And it's kind of like a detective game, trying to figure out what are the wild ancestors of the plants and animals that we eat now. And this is the kind of question for botanists. So let's take the example of rice. This is a rice plant growing here. Wild rice occurs in India and in China and probably in areas in between. And for a long time, there's been a big uh, debate about, well, did rice, was it originally cultivated? Was it originally domesticated, changed from the wild into the cultivated form in India? Or did that happen in China? And the most recent evidence suggests that white rice was originally domesticated in China. <clears throat> so this is um, one aspect of ethnobotany, which is the study of how plants and people affect each other. That's a very simple definition. Um, yeah, question. Do that, you see the role, the role and the culture, it, it affects the environment greatly. Mm -hmm. Not only indigenous, indigenous, the Arctic and the Antarctic, but, but also depriving the, depriving the land of food mm -hmm. that, the, that the animal needs, that the animals need more. Okay, thank you for that comment. That's right, so we're changing everything on the globe. Um, and one of the things that we do when we, when we um, process food is we're oftentimes we're making it more edible. So right here, we'll talk a little bit later about bitter melon. Um, this is a bitter melon that I got in Chinatown in Victoria yesterday. It is very, very bitter. Um, and one of the ways this man is making it more edible is by roasting it, and roasting um, helps destroy some of the bitter compounds. 
So ethnobotany, many people think of medicinal plants. That's the first thing that comes to mind. But there's a whole other field of ethnobotany which has to do with agriculture and botany and the domestication of plants. So there's two ways to approach ethnobotany, two ways to think about it. The first way um, is how has a species affected human history? And the opium poppy has had a huge impact on Chinese history. The opium poppy was during the late 1700s and 1800s. There was trade between India and China. The British were um, bringing opium from India and, and selling it in China. It was a great source of trade from them. And the Chinese leaders didn't want their people using opium for all the reasons you can imagine. It makes them um, not want to work hard. It, they become addicted from it. They can't stop using it. They must use more and more in order to feel good. So the Chinese tried very hard to prevent the import of opium. So there's actually two wars. We call them the Opium Wars that resulted from this. And one of the outcomes was that the British forced the Chinese to give up Hong Kong to the British. So that's how Hong Kong became a British colony, was a result of the Opium Wars. <clears throat> I was in China in 1997 when Hong Kong was returned to what we call mainland China, and it was a really moving time for the Chinese people because they had felt insulted for these hundred some years by having this part of their land occupied by Britain. Now it's also a source of some really important medicines, morphine and codeine, if you take a cough suppressant, it may have codeine in it, if it's a prescription cough prescription. But heroin is also derived, it's a similar chemical to uh, morphine and codeine. The problem with heroin is it's much more addictive. And it was developed um, after the American Civil War, it was found that morphine was an effective treatment for um, the casualties of the American Civil War. Um, <clears throat> and then they they, uh, it was somewhat addictive, so they tried to f form a new chemical that would be less addictive, and unfortunately what they formed, what they produced was heroin, which is actually much more addictive. So that's one way to think of ethnobotany, how have plants affected human history? Another way is how have humans changed a plant? So kind of the reverse. And probably, probably the best example of that is corn. So you, there's no scale in here, but these are tiny little ears of wild corn or very early domesticates. They're no bigger than your finger. And it's globally one of the most important food plants in Africa and Asia, but it originally came from North America, specifically Mexico. This is one of my favorite pictures because here's corn in China. And it's become a very important crop in China as well as, as in the Indian subcontinent. So this is Nepal. And right there is a whole lot of corn that's just been harvested. And what you can't see here is the villagers have put all these sharp, spiky plant branches on, the, on these posts. So when the rats climb up to try to get to the corn, they can't reach it. Now, the one point to keep in mind is we should be thankful to all the early farmers who helped develop our crops because no scientist could ever have imagined an ear of corn. There's nothing in nature that resembles an ear of corn. There's no wild plant that looks like an ear of corn. The wild plants are these. So in the process of gradual human selection, early farmers changed that plant into what we now call corn. The other thing, the other impact that corn has had on the globe is it's allowed people to grow food in places where they couldn't grow food before. And it could have led to the increase in population in China, for example. So this is a plant that it produces very well, and they're able to increase the amount of food on land that they weren't cultivated using plants that were originally in China. Another thing that I found really interesting, here's a picture I took in China. How many of you know what a tamale is? What's a tamale? Can you tell me? Can your mom or dad? It's got a wrapper, and what's in the very center often is, is some meat. Okay. Now, what is that? I mean, that's ground corn cooked in a wrapper. So not only did the plant come into China, probably via the Philippines by the Spanish, but possibly um, from, from the south. Um, but the technology on how to cook it also came in. Now, there's no meat in the center of that, but I, I just, when I looked at that, I thought, oh my gosh, that's a Mexican tamale. The plant and the technology both came from Mexico um, to China. So there's some common changes that happen to plants as a result of domestication, that process whereby 
um, the, the original plant is changed into something from its wild ancestor into something that humans use. Now the most obvious thing is increase in the size of the plant that's harvested. So uh, almost all crops, tomatoes, um, apples, any kind of melon, the wild ancestor is very small. Loss of dispersal, why would that be important? Dispersal means the, the way the seeds or the fruit fall off the plant. Why would it be important for them to not fall off the plant? Yeah. Oh, that's a great answer because mice might invade. Yeah, in the back. It might get damaged, okay. What else might happen? Yeah. The seeds may not spread, okay, and if you're an early farmer, do you want the seeds to fall off the plant or do you want the seeds to stay on the plant until you can come and pick them? You want them to stay on the plant, good, okay. So most plants, most native plants, natural plants, they want, as if they plants think, but what they want to do is they want to spread their seeds as far as possible. So what we want is for the seeds to stay on the plant until we can come and harvest it. The wild ancestors of many of our uh, cultivated, domesticated plants are toxic, they're poisonous. All of the melons, watermelon, the squashes, the wild ancestors of those plants are poisonous. Why might that be? They taste really bitter. Yeah? Okay, because of the acid or some other chemical. If you are a plant and I come chasing you, what are you going to do? I'm going to come chase you. I want to eat part of your leaves. What are you going to do? Mm, be poisonous. Be po why, are you going to, why don't you run away? Mm, because I don't have legs. Because I don't have legs. Okay, so plants don't have legs, so they can't move. Okay, so in order to protect themselves from being eaten, they, they have to stay in one place, so they produce all these compounds. Now, some of those compounds we call medicine, and in higher doses, we call them poisons. Uniform timing of maturation. Yeah. Lose its toxicity. Very, very good question. Probably because in every generation, when there's reproduction, there's many, many seeds that are produced. And just by chance, a few of those seeds might not, there might have been a mutation that prevents them from making the toxic chemical. And if the production of that toxic chemical only requires one or two genes, one or two changes, then it's actually is relatively um, common for this kind of thing to happen. Now, the most important step, though, is that there be a human present to note, oops, that vine that usually produces sour or poisonous or bitter fruit, that one doesn't. And so they would pick that one and they would save the seeds. That's a great question. So uniform timing of maturation. Um, again, a farmer doesn't want to go out tomorrow and harvest a few stems and the next day harvest another few stems and the next day harvest a few more stems. They want to harvest all at the same time, especially with machines. And many of our plants are dependent upon us to create the right environment. So these are some of the common changes. Now this might surprise you. Here's a few plants and where they originally were domesticated. The most important plants, of course, are cacao. What does cacao produce? Chocolate, okay. The second most important plant, especially to your parents, is coffee. Okay, so coffee is from Africa. Originally, it's now grown all over the world. Cacao is from South America. What do you think of when you think of Italian cooking? Pizza, what kind, of, what kind of sauces are on a pizza? Tomato sauce, okay, where's Italy? Europe, okay, where did tomatoes come from? South America. So only in the last, what, 1492, so the last, only in the last 430 some years have Italians had tomatoes to make tomato sauce. Chili peppers, what do you think of when you think of Thai cooking? Yeah. Thai food. Thai food, okay, and what, what's the taste of Thai food often? It's, it's, very, it's, it's very spicy. Very spicy. I mean, you can ask the waitress, you know, how many peppers to add. Okay, so well, what, what was Thai food before they had chili peppers? Okay, so we have, um, humans have spread these different crops all over the globe to make our foods that we think of as being present in those countries for hundreds of years, but maybe they're more recent than that. So let's just review a little bit. Ethnobotany is how plants and people affect each other. 
And it's way cool because, and we've talked about it a little bit already, and we'll talk about it some more, is that you talk about botany and anthropology. Anthropology is the study of how people um, interact with each other. Archaeology is the study of how um, long ago cultures uh, lived. Uh, linguistics is the study of language. And biochemistry is the study of the chemicals that plants produce. We'll talk a little bit about that. Now, plants also have a lot of symbolism. That's why I've put this, uh, these roses here. <clears throat> Someone I'm very close to uh, once looked out the window and saw some young man walking up the walk carrying a dozen red roses. And uh, this person met the young man at the door and said, I'm not interested. <laughs> I just can't imagine. Uh, the poor young man. OK, so plants, uh, plants communicate lots of information. Sometimes we use symbols to communicate information when words are a little more difficult. So today I'm going to talk a little bit about um, three melons um, and what I wanted to learn about how humans, remember we talked about humans change plants, so I wanted to learn a little bit about how they've changed these plants. I wanted to learn about where were they domesticated and the ideas that have been put forward um, were India uh, or China and Southeast Asia. And I also wanted to learn a little bit about the cultural importance of these plants. So they have use as food, but what other kinds of use do they have? I was interested in all of these things. Yeah. Mmm, we might just talk a little bit about that. Yep. Okay, so here's the three plants. Uh, bitter melon. Here's another bitter melon. Um, loofah sponge, and we'll talk about that. There's two kinds of loofahs. Here's one of them. This is called a ridged loofah or angular loofah. And um, this is a kind of wax gourd or uh, malgua, hairy gourd, it's called when it's young. And we'll talk a little bit more about all of these. So what did I do? I went to China, and during my field trips, I went to China, Laos, and Nepal. Now, I wanted to go to India because, remember, earlier I, I showed that some of those plants maybe were originally domesticated in India. But the Indian government said, you're welcome to come, but you must get a permit to remove seeds because they felt that the plants that grew within the boundaries of India belonged to India. So I tried to get a permit. Um, and I asked for a permit in 1997, and I still haven't heard. So um, <laughs> in the meantime, I contacted a friend in Nepal, and Nepal is a country very close to India. So I wanted to use Nepal to somewhat represent India. Um, and so I went to many different villages. Um, what, why I was going to villages was to ask them to give me a few seeds so I could do some other studies. And that's why um, the Indian government um, was reluctant to let me remove some seeds. And I was also searching for the wild populations. Um, so during my field work, um, I collected lots of bitter melon samples, lots of loofah samples, lots of wax gourd samples. And the other thing I wanted to do was to learn from the villagers the stories they had about these plants. I, I wanted to know, did they have any stories about these plants? Um, and how did they grow them? I also wanted to know, what other uses do they have for these plants? Because I know other uses, food. Yeah. Mm hmm So what about agriculture and water? The I was living right beside the Mekong River and it was polluted. Yeah. So it's not agriculture, it's the use of it, well, it's the use of chemicals in agriculture. Okay, so where did we live in China? So like I said, I spent about two and a half years in China. Where we lived is in Yunnan province. It's referred to as southwest China, although you can see it's much more south than it is west. And we spent six months in Kunming studying Mandarin. And then we moved down to this beautiful part of China called Xishuang Bana. This is uh, just a little bit about what the landscape looks like. Um, very mountainous. In, in the two and a half years I lived in China, I never took a train. There's just no trains in this part of the country. Now, the main reason to go to this part of China is that there's many different ethnic groups, and they're still growing lots of old cultivars, and the wild type, in some cases, still occur there as well. So to do this kind of study, you need to go to places where people are still practicing traditional agriculture to some extent. So this is where we lived, um, down at this institute here. 
And um, it was a tributary of the Mekong River right there. Um, our house was well, where we lived was right, right around there, a beautiful view across the river. And they bu built this um, fabulous bamboo bridge to get across the river. So the, the different ethnic groups in this area, there was many. Um, at least within 10 kilometers, there's four or five different ethnic groups. And these are not, these are not the, um, the dominant or the most uh, common um, Chinese ethnic group, which is the Han Chinese. These are different, totally different ethnic groups, different language groups altogether, some of them. So the Dai minority villages, um, they live in the basins. Uh, they cultivate, uh, they're, they're essentially the same racial group as the um, Thai people. <clears throat> and they live in the basins and they cultivate rice in uh, more or less uh, fertile situations. In the same land in the wintertime during the, during the dry season, they grow watermelons. Uh, they're plowing with a water buffalo. And in the same general area, but in the mountains, are totally different ethnic groups. So here's one uh, village I visited um, called the Lafu uh, minority. Um, another minority group, the Yao people. Those are shingles made from split bamboo. Many, many uses for bamboo. Uh, the Hani people are in uh, northern Thailand. This is more or less the same ethnic group as the um, Aka or um, Hani. Um, this is by, uh, another member of the Yao minority on the left. And here's my wife in the middle. And on the right is my Chinese colleague, uh, my very good friend, Professor Xia Yongmei. And she accompanied me on all my field trips, and she spoke some English, and so she was able to translate for me, um, which I needed much of the time. And she was doing a similar study. Um, and this is a village close to the border with Myanmar, another ethnic group, the Jingpo people, and the Lisu people. And she's holding a little gourd, a little vine of a, a relative of bitter melon, and she was just curious to see. She'd found it growing in the mountains, and so she decided to take some seeds and plant it in her garden. And so this is kind of the initial, the incipient, the first stage in domestication, where somebody gets curious about a plant, and they plant it in their garden to see what'll happen. So in, the, uh, in this part of the tropics, they practice a form of agriculture called slash and burn agriculture which has been developed um, all around the globe. Um, prior to the increase in population, it's a very sustainable form of agriculture. In fact, in the tropics, it's probably the only sustainable form of agriculture. And I'll explain why. is because all the, all the nutrients in a tropical ecosystem, in most tropical ecosystems, the nutrients are in the biomass. They're not in the soil. In temperate ecosystems, like where we live, all the nutrients are stored in the soil, or a lot of the nutrients are stored in the soil. There's that topsoil. But in the tropics, there's very little topsoil. A leaf falls off the plant. It decomposes very quickly. The nutrients are taken up right away by the, the leaves, uh, by, by the roots. Um, now, <clears throat> the way this agriculture was traditionally practiced is each family would have lots of different uh, uh, farm plots like this scattered across the landscape. And they would cultivate it for maybe three or four years. And then they would let the forest come back. And 30 years later, they would come back to the same place and cut the forest and burn it and release the, release the nutrients from the biomass, from the trees, into the soil. And then a new crop that could be grown for two or three years. That was great until the population increased. And now there's not enough land for everyone to practice this form of agriculture. I just happened to come across on, on one of my um, walks a, 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 a group of people planting together and this man here, I, I assume these are husband and wife teams, um, has got a long stick with a metal thing in it in the end. And he's making a little hole. And his wife has got a bag of seed. And she's putting the seed in. And they're going across that big landscape very, very fast. And within a few hours, they had all of that area and much more planted. Now they're growing. Um, and this, this is what it'll look like um, in about four months. So this is upland rice, it's called. Um, it doesn't require, they depend on the rains to water the plants. It doesn't require um, water from uh, paddy fields. And they're growing many, many different kinds of rice. The institute where we lived had about 2,000 different samples of rice. And just from the size and the shape and the color of the grains, you get a sense of the diversity. This diversity is really, really important to preserve in order for us to have a good food supply in the future. They leave a few stumps. Um, these are loofah vines growing on the stump. 
So here's uh, the upland rice, and then they leave some stumps for the vines to grow on. And they're growing lots of other plants in those fields as well. In fact, in the Philippines, it's been documented they're growing up to 80 different kinds of plants in those slash and burn fields. These, here's my lens cap. It's about that big. And these are great big cucumbers. They're not um, cantaloupe or muskmelon. So the institute where I was living was doing development work in northern Laos to try to get Laotian farmers to stop growing opium because that opium was coming across the border into China. So I took advantage of the fact that they were making trips down to Laos and I accompanied them and collected more samples as well. So here is my colleague, Professor Xia, and here's a Laotian woman that spoke Chinese as well as the Laotian languages, and so she was um, helping us collect information. And this young man, um, Laotian man, also helped me collect seeds. The way I did it, I would buy the melons from the villagers, and then I would remove a few seeds, and then I would return the melon to the villagers, and they would feed them to their pigs, or perhaps they would eat them themselves. So then, as I said, also, I wanted to go to India because I wanted to compare China and India. Those are two places where these plants might have originally been domesticated. Um, but I, I didn't get permission, so I went to um, the tropical part of Nepal instead. And this man here, uh, Prof Professor uh, Nirmal Bhattarai, was a, is a very good Nepalese ethnobotanist. He's been doing field work in Nepal for 20 or 25 years. And uh, he accompanied me on a field trip for 17 days. Where I am now is in an area that's closed to the public. It's uh, Parsa Wildlife Preserve. Um, there's a military barracks there. And these military bases are scattered around the edge of the preserve. And they are patrolling to keep Nepalese villagers from going into the forest and, and shooting animals and collecting plants for food. Now this is a bit of a problem because the Nepalese villagers, they need something to eat, obviously. They need to be able to harvest wild plants. They need to be able to um, uh, kill animals for their food. Um, and so if there wasn't the military presence there, um, then it, the forest might be destroyed. But there has to be some kind of agreement worked out between the villagers and the military. So this is what the Parsa Wildlife Preserve looks like. Largely undisturbed tropical dipterocarp forest. Um, if the military wasn't there patrolling, this is what it would eventually look like. Um, all of this is agricultural land um, close to the northern India uh, in the border area between India and Nepal. The villagers need somewhere to grow their food, and so this is where they're growing their food now. Um, and here's just one uh, Nepalese village. And uh, this, in case you can't read it, this is a sign. It was just fabulous. Politicians are same all over. They promise to build a bridge even when there is no river. So some Nepalese villager had um, obviously studied some English and um, wrote that. So how did I um, go about doing this study? Um, so I, as I said, I was going to many villages. I was asking them to give me seeds. I was trying to do interviews to learn about the plants they were growing. And then I brought all the seeds back to the Shishuang Bana Tropical Botanical Garden. And I grew all the plants up. And I did that because I wanted to compare them, the wild type, to the domesticated type. And I did lots of measurements on flowers, fruits, seeds, anything I could measure. And then I did some genetic studies as well. <clears throat> so my typical day was, it was just a fabulous way to live. Um, I'd get up, have breakfast with my wife, I'd go to the field, I'd do some measurements for a few hours. Um, no sounds, a city, no, just beautiful silence, birds in the background, farmers in the fields nearby. And then in the afternoon, I would go to a laboratory and I'd do some genetic studies. So I'll just go through these three plants now. And what I learned, um, bitter melon, um, it has anti-diabetic properties. It's not an insulin substitute. There's some other way by which it um, is thought to be effective in treating diabetes. The really fascinating thing is it's, a, it's an old world plant. It's, it's a plant that originated in Asia, but it came to the New World, to South America, via the slave trade from Africa several hundred years ago. And not only did the plant come, but the knowledge that it might be useful for treating diabetes also came to the New World, to South America. And if you read about the lists of medicinal plants that are used in South America, in many of those lists, bitter melon, this Asian plant, is said to be their most effective medicine. So that's quite a status for an introduced plant into a new culture um, to acquire. Can anyone see 
the, uh, the immature, the unripe bitter melon in this picture? See right there? Is it sort of camouflage? Have you guys studied, you younger kids studied camouflage yet? Camouflage, okay. Why do you think that plant's trying to be kind of camouflage? Yeah. And why is that important right now for this one? Great. Great answer. Okay, so the seeds are forming there. They're not mature yet. Now, as soon as the seeds form, two things happen. The out part, outside part of the fruit turns yellow, and the seeds are surrounded by this sweet, fleshy tissue. So it's as if it's, it's declaring to the animal world, okay, come and eat me. I'm, and you know, swallow me, take some of the nutrition from me, but pass the seed out the other end. So it's a fabulous way. Tomatoes do this as well, right? I mean, our tomatoes are green until they're ripe, and then they turn red. Um, so here, this man, we started off with this slide early on. He's roasting the bitter melon. So the, the Chinese people and Indian people, uh, they want to eat the bitter melon, and they, they want to have the bitter flavor. That's a very different concept from Westerners where we don't like bitterness. We like sweet. Um, and so, but it's a little bit too bitter. So he is roasting them. Um, and he actually, the, this is the second try. The first try he pushed into the fire pit and he left them in there too long so they burned up. So he's putting in a second set. So that he's roasting them to reduce the bitterness. And just in the field where I was growing them, so I, I was able to do lots of observations. So here's the wild ones. Here's the cross sections of all these same fruit. And by the way, fruit are what? This is grade three or grade four curriculum. A fruit, yeah. It's a structure that contains seeds. So forget about supermarket taxonomy or classification. A fruit is any structure that contains seeds. Yeah. So some vegetables contain seeds, some don't. So what's lettuce? Lettuce is a vegetable. It's a leaf, though. Yes. Yeah. So it's a vegetable, but those categories, fruits and vegetables, are sort of artificial when you come to, into botany. So what has happened in the process of domestication is you have these wild fruit that are very small, and the fleshy part around the, the outside is relatively thin. And as a result of domestication, repeated human selection, they've become much thicker. So that's, and bigger. Now the seeds of the domesticated form are much larger than the wild form as well. This is probably unintentional. It just happened in the process of domestication. But if anyone were ever to find an archeological site, say 5,000 years old, that had bitter melon seeds, they would be able to distinguish, is it the domesticate or the wild? Now, one thing that's really important is that wild, the wild ancestors of our crops contain genes. They contain um, characteristics that we really need to preserve for our food plants. And this is just an ex bitter melon is an example, but this example applies to any plant that we use. So there's a, a type of beetle that specializes on eating um, any melon plant. And uh, there was an outbreak at the field where I was growing them. So the domesticated bitter melon was totally destroyed. There was no, they, the beetles ate everything. The bitter, wild bitter melon was totally untouched. So the wild bitter melon has some genes that prevent the insects, even this, this beetle that specializes on this family, they prevent this insect from defoliating, from eating all the leaves. So it's very important. Someday someone might want to transfer the genes through traditional breeding or otherwise um, into the domesticated form. So I did some morphology analysis, and I won't explain all the details of how that was done, but this is a summary. This figure here summarizes a whole lot of measurements, and there's a method called principal components analysis, and I won't explain that. Um, here's the wild type from China, Laos, and here's the domesticated forms, and you can see the ones from China and Laos are more closely similar to the wild type than are the domesticated forms from Nepal. So this would be one line of evidence that would suggest that the plant was originally domesticated in the area of China and Laos. So I did some genetic analysis. I used allozymes or isozymes, um, which were um, very useful in the 80s and 90s before the use of DNA markers. And what I found is that the domesticated forms 
all were the same genetically. Um, and I'm talking about genealogies. So I'm talking about a genetic marker. I'm not talking about um, genes that control any particular feature. Um, now the wild ones, they were similar to each other, but they neither the wild nor the one from China were similar to the domesticated, or the wild ones from China and Nepal were not especially similar to the domesticated forms. And one way to think of this is imagine the domesticated form was a dog, and imagine the wild ones from China and Nepal were dogs without tails. Okay, so what I'm still looking for is where, is where in the world is there a population of bitter melon or dogless in this example that has a tail? And in particular, there's a particular allele, a particular gene that I'll just call MDH3A. And wherever there is a wild population that has this MDH3A gene, that is the, probably the local, that is probably the area where the domesticated came from. So that's, um, I'll leave that aside for now. So I didn't actually totally answer the question that I set out to do. And that's the way science is. Often we start out and want to answer a question, and sometimes we get closer to the answer, but we still don't answer it. So let's just summarize. Uh, bitter melon was processed to reduce the bitterness, um, is soaked in salt water, roasted, or pounded. Um, but humans seem to prefer that there be some bitterness. In fact, I read a paper in India where um, they can the bitter melon, and they're trying to figure out how to preserve the bitterness. And it's because in the Indian and the Chinese belief around um, uh, the maintaining a, a balance between hot and cold, bitter melon is cooling. Um, larger fruit, and then there's a cultural difference in the tissue that's consumed. So in China, only the flesh is eaten. And in India and Nepal, they're chopped up and both the seeds and the flesh are eaten. Now just a brief um, diversion from the difference between food and medicine. Um, in North America, we think of food as being tasting good and medicine tastes bad. But in much of the rest of the world, food and medicine are the same thing. Substances are eaten because they have efficacious efficacy as a medicine, but they're also eaten because they're food. Another little cultural difference, um, we take, we feel like vitamin C is very important for treating a cold, so we encourage each other to eat oranges. I had a cold in China, I bought some oranges, and my colleagues say, don't eat it. It's hot, it's a hot food. It doesn't mean temperature hot, it means it's a hot food um, in their culture. And it's, you, when you have a cold, you should eat something that's cooling because a cold is hot. So you should balance it with something that's cooling. So the second plant I'll talk about briefly is loofah. Uh, this is the vegetable sponge. And here's a mature loofah fruit right there. And when you peel off the skin, it's similar to this one, but a little different. Um, there's this fiber. And we use that for scrubbing. Um, it's used in life jackets. It's used in all kinds of purposes. Um, but it, when it's roughly half the size, you would never eat this. It would just be like eating um, you know, yarn. Um, <laughs> it wouldn't taste very good and it'd be unpalatable. But when the fruit is very small, it's edible, and there's flowers or can be eaten as well. <clears throat> and one of the reasons it might have originally been domesticated is in that part of China, there's a, a type of rice called sticky rice. And sticky rice is steamed, it's not boiled. So you have a wok, you put the wok over fire, and you put this vessel in the wok, but the vessel has to be open in the bottom so that steam can pass through it. Now, but you have to get the rice in there as well, right? So you have to have something in the bottom of this cooking vessel that allows the steam through but doesn't allow the rice to fall down. So I think, I, one of my speculations is that possibly the original reason this plant was domesticated, because farmer villagers are still using this in the bottom of their rice cooking vessels. So it could be that the reason that was originally domesticated was for cooking steamed rice. So the wild loofah, this is a wild loofah fruit. The rest of these are cultivated, domesticated. This is intensely bitter. If I could have brought tiny little pieces, and if you'd eaten just a tiny piece, you were, you're, you'd have this terrible bitter flavor in your mouth for hours and hours. The old cultivars and the new cultivars are not bitter. So just to, what do these plants look like? Um, smooth loofah has a long stalk with lots of male flowers. So the male flowers and the female flowers are different. They're kept separate. There's a female flower. So those of you who have grown pumpkins and squash, you might have noticed that some of them produced fruit and some of them didn't. Okay, so male flowers, just like as men don't get pregnant, male flowers can't produce fruit. Uh, female flowers can produce fruit. 
and the leaves are very different as well. So part of what I was doing was documenting all as much information as I could about these old cultivars. So there's the wild smooth loofah, very different kind of leaves from all these others. Now something else that I wanted to document, so I'm growing all these plants in this field together, so I was always thinking about what else could I learn. So I'm doing genetic analysis, I'm an analyzing the shape. So on this axis here is when does the first flower appear? So this is a node. As, this, as a vine grows, it keeps producing leaves, right? And at each, each point where the leaf is produced, it's called a node. So um, the, in uh, the wild type, it was about 40 nodes until the first flower was formed. But in the domesticated form, and from China and Nepal, some of, the early, some of the domesticated forms began producing flowers much earlier. So it's obvious human selection for choosing a plant that produces flowers earlier because the earlier the flowers are produced, the sooner there will be fruit to harvest for food. Now something else is interesting. This is a different kind of uh, loofah called angular loofah. And in villages in Nepal, they would bring to me seeds that looked just like the seeds from these plants, but they came from these tiny little fruits. And they said, and they said to me they grew in clusters. But as far as I understood, at a single node, a uh, single part of the plant, only one fruit was produced at a time. So what it turns out has happened is that, the, here's a little cartoon about a flowering stalk. There'll be a cluster of male flowers, a single female flower. And then uh, a male flower is male because of the absence of female. It's not a positive attribute to be male. It's the it's absence of female tissue. Um, a female flower is the absence of male, okay? But each flower has the potential to produce both male and female. So what appears to have happened is that femaleness in these male flowers, this may be a little hard to follow, uh, femaleness has been restored. So now we have these hermaphrodite, they're called, flowers that produce both male and female. So these flowers now can produce fruit. This, so you, this is how you get a cluster of fruit at a single location. The question is, was that accidental, that it just happened in nature and humans liked it, or did he, somehow humans intentionally select it? So there's been a loss of bitterness, an increase in the fruit. Um, the seeds are kept within the fruit rather than falling out. Earlier flowering, and it appears that humans may have selected for mutant that restores femaleness to male flowers. So the final plant I'll talk about, and then we're going to talk a little bit about creation story. Um, is wax gourd, or is sometimes called winter melon. I'm sure you've seen this in Chinatown here. Um, Indian and Chinese both have a tradition of, of taking the flesh and soaking it in sugar solution, and it's, it's just another way of getting sugar into your body, of which there are so many wonderful ways, chocolate being one of the best. Um, a beverage is also made, but it could well be that the wild is extinct. So this is what the plants look like. It's called wax gourd because when the fruit become ripe and mature, they get this waxy coating on the outside, but the immature ones, like this one here, are just hairy. And in, um, in Nepal, for vegetarians, there are some situations where it's important to sacrifice a goat, and vegetarians can sacrifice a wax gourd instead. Now, that's not what he's doing here. He's cutting it in order to give me seeds, but uh, that's part of their tradition. Um, they often grow them on the roof in Nepal, Um, here's what a, a modern cultivar looks like, very large. They're like this large. They can be up to 90 kilos, no, 40 kilos, 90 pounds. But a single village in Laos is growing all these smaller cultivars. Here's a 15 centimeter ruler. So this one village is preserving all of this genetic diversity in these wax gourds. Now something funny happened here. Um, so I wanted to photograph, this is a single farmer and these are the wax gourds he's growing. I wanted to get a photograph of them, but he started cutting them open, especially this one. You see it's kind of got some cuts on it and they were gonna give me the seeds. So I said, no, 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 I want a picture first. So they took some bamboo and they made little toothpicks out of the bamboo and so they're putting that one back together. <laughs> so this was, yeah, that was fun. Um, I must say I just had fabulous experience in China. I loved going to villages. Um, this is just a range of variation in the seeds. Um, so any kind of, of variation like this, you can look at it and you can say, boy, there's not much variation in Nepal. There's a lot in Laos and China. 
probably this plant was originally domesticated in the area where there is the most diversity, and that diversity is in this area of China and Laos. Now something else um, villagers would tell me in a couple villages is um, there's a ping zhong, yi zhong, ping zhong, bunung, pa shu. So there's a type of, um, of winter gourd, wax melon, that can't climb a tree. And they said, and which means it doesn't have a tendril. The tendril is a little part that wraps around. So I grew up these plants, and sure enough, when I grew them up, this one cultivar doesn't produce a tendril. So I asked, well, what, so I was trying to understand, why are you guys growing this plant that doesn't have a tendril? Is there any advantage to that? And what they said was when that plant grows, remember these, a lot of these are growing in these fields with rice. When that plant grows in the field with rice, the tendril can't wrap around the rice stalks and bend it over. And it, it seemed like it was an issue more about harvesting than preventing the plant from growing. So um, one of those interesting things. So I was growing all these melons, and I thought, what more can I learn from these melons? So I got a small grant to study the nutritional contact, content, um, and I analyzed the protein content. So here's the protein content of some old cultivars and some new ones. And then here's a single publication. Not a lot has been learned about these plants in the past. So you can see the protein content is superior in the old cultivars compared to the new. This is another reason why it's really important to preserve these old cultivars. I did analyze about 15 different parameters, and in general, for all three crops, the new were inferior to the old. So the domestication is increased in fruit. Some have lost the tendril. That probably is intentional. Uh, the greatest morphological diversity is in China and Laos, and new, new cultivars are less nutritious. So I'm just going to finish with a creation story of the Yao people. <clears throat> so long ago, the, the um, human beings were evil and wicked. And the heavenly beings decided to investigate and to understand why that was. So they sent a representative to Earth, to a particular house, and that representative was called Lei Gong. And that house knew that Lei Gong was going, so they was coming to Earth. So they sacrificed a dog and spread its blood on the roof of the house. And when Lei Gong came to Earth, when it passed by that house, it lost its power, so it fell down to that house. And the family there decided they were going to kill Lei Gong. And the father went looking for salt. They were going to kill Lei Gong and, and pickle his flesh, or its flesh. So the father said to the little boy, do not give Lei Gong water. So the father went off, the father and the mother went off to get salt to pickle and to kill Lei Gong. To kill and then pickle Lei Gong. And um, Lei Gong was thirsty, so Lei Gong asked the little boy for some water. And the little boy said no. And Lei Gong asked again, even if you give me some dirty water. And finally, the little boy relented and gave Lei Gong some water. And he, Lei Gong asked him two more times each time he gave water. So Lei Gong went back to the heavens and he said, human beings are evil. They tried to kill me. So the heavenly beings decided to drown the earth. <clears throat> and in the bottom of the ocean, there's a little hole. And that's where the water drains out of the ocean. Otherwise, because it rains all the time, right, the, the water would rise up over the land. So the heavenly beings sent a kind of crab to plug up the hole. So the crab went to the hole, plugged up the hole, so the water couldn't drain out of the bottom of the ocean any longer. So the water level rose and rose and rose and rose. Now, Lei Gong remembered this brother and sister that had been kind to him and given him water. So Lei Gong sent him the seeds of a, of a, a um, water uh, bottle gourd. And this fruit grew up, the, the plant grew up, and the little boy and his the brother and sister got into the water gourd and they floated and they survived. So the, the water gourd was called a hulu or fulu, um, reached the heavenly beings, heavenly realm. And at that point, the heavenly beings knew that the earth was drowned. So they let the water come back down. And the, little bro the brother and sister got out of the water gourd and they encountered a turtle and they asked the turtle, were there other people on the earth? And the turtle said, no, you should marry your sister. Now, all of us know you should never marry your sister. So the little boy said, no, I won't do that. So he beat the turtle. And that's how the turtle got the pattern on its back. And then the, uh, a, a piece of bamboo came along, and the bamboo said, you should marry your sister. The little boy said, no. So he beat the bamboo. That's how bamboo got the segments on the stem. An ant came along. You can guess what happened, right? 
How many parts to an ant? Three parts. Okay. The ant said, you should marry your sister. The little boy said, no. So the little boy beat the ant. And that's, how, that's why ants have three segments. So finally, the little boy said, okay, let's plant two bamboo stems on opposite mountains. And if those stems grow together, I will marry my sister. So after a period of time, sure enough, the stems grew together and he married his sister. This story in various forms exists in many different ethnic groups in Southeast Asia and India, and I believe even um, Taiwan. In some versions of the story, rocks are put on the tops of two mountains and they roll together, and that's a signal the brother should marry his sister. In another version, the smoke fires are lit on two different mountains and the smoke comes together, so the brother and sister marry. Um, now, the brother and the sister do marry. She gives birth, but she doesn't give birth to a human being. She gave birth to a wax gourd. <laughs> and in other versions of the story, she gives birth to a pumpkin. In fact, in all other versions of the story, she gives birth either to a pumpkin or a bloody mass of flesh. And maybe this is some kind of punishment that might be reading too much into the story. But um, what hap why is that so important? Now, the, the, the Yao people believe that all human beings are descended from the fruit of that wax gourd. And so the, brother, the sister had told the brother, cut up the wax gourd and spread the flesh of the wax gourd in the mountains and the seeds in the basins. So the brother's about to do that. But when he's just about to do it, he tripped. And he spread the flesh in the basins. And he spread the seeds in the mountains. So the Dai people who live in the basins, they are, they are wealthy. They are derived from the flesh of the wax gourd. And the mountain people are impoverished. They have hard lives. And they are descendants of the plants that came from those seeds. Now, it's interesting because pumpkin is also what is often described in these stories. But pumpkin is a new world crop. In other words, it's only been in Southeast Asia for 450 years or so. Um, so my guess, and there's other reasons for this, is that what they, all the stories actually originally mean a wax gourd. Here's some pumpkins. Here's a wax gourd. The plants look similar. The fruit looks similar. So I think probably it was a wax gourd. So I'm going to finish with this slide. Um, just acknowledging I was funded by the U.S. National Science Foundation and the Conservation Food and Health Foundation gave me the money to do the nutritional analysis at a lab in Kunming. Now, why am I start, start finishing with this slide? This is an image of a bottle gourd. This is what the brother and sister survived in, in the flood story. And what's inside this particular bottle gourd is lots of seeds, lots of genetic diversity, lots of diversity of many different crops. This is how this farmer stores these seeds uh, for planting the next growing season. So just as this plant is really important to the, the history, the story behind where people came from the earth, this plant's also, this gourd is also really important for the future because of the genetic diversity that's stored in the seeds that are in that gourd. So thank you very much. I'd be happy to answer any questions. If anyone's really brave, we could wash this bitter gourd, bitter melon, and um, you could have a small slice. I don't know if it's really bitter or not. Yeah. A little bit long. Thank you for hanging in there. Great.